This is In Boot Camp, episode 16, Tools and Tricks, on Saturday, May 4th, 2019, with your hosts, Matthew Petchel and Ryan Rampersad. You can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash IB16. Hey, how's it going? Uh, it's going pretty well. How about you today? I'm doing pretty well. What fine weather we got this week. Yes, this this time it's actually good. It was a little cool uh, at the beginning of the week, uh, but today it was really nice out. And, uh, yeah, and I heard you had a busy week this week. I did have a busy week this week. Uh, I was meeting with the international team, and so we had a ton of guests in from out of town, uh, also out of the country. That's what makes them international. And uh, it was a really good week. We got a ton of stuff done. You know, we're, we're all doing really well. Uh, one, one of the funny things, since we like talking about weather at the beginning of every episode, is that all week they are telling us that they're really cold. And so we had to tell the uh, hotel meeting, big meeting room, we had to tell the hotel, hey, can you turn up the heat because it's apparently freezing in here. But it's like 70-something else. Uh, well, it was it was probably colder than that inside of the building. It was, you know, big meeting room. Huh. It was probably like 68, and that was chilly. Wow. Well, <laughs> they're not Minnesota. Yeah. No, not not quite. Uh, this week at boot camp was a little different than most. Um, so normally... We have a little show, and I like to say, hey, guess what new concept we learned this week, or guess what we did this week. Um, Nothing really new coding-wise. We did a few little exercises, but this week wasn't a whole lot of learning how to code or program. Um, That's good. It's good to have a week where you learn about something else. Well, yeah, because like I was about to say, well, then there's not going to be anything for the show. But no, we actually spent a lot of time talking about tools and different ways of doing things and announcing our group project that's coming up. And it was an interesting week. To start things off, we did do a whole lot more with uh, SQLize. And this has happened a few times before where they show us a bad way to do something and then they show us the right way to do it. And I really wish they would have showed us how to use SQLize from the get-go pretty much instead of make our own ORM and everything else and... I don't know. At uh, it's done. We know what to do with it. We can actually do stuff. We can, you know, do the whole crud. I don't want to say crud stack, but we can do everything we could do without with just regular SQLize and AJAX and stuff. So what was uh, what was it like writing your own ORM? Yeah, it um, a lot of copy and paste with the instructor head up, and then just mutating it to fit our needs and stuff. Um, but everyone had a different. I mean, it wasn't consistent. Uh, now that everyone's forced to use SQLize and stuff, all of our code looks the same. And now that we're in a group project, that is very valuable. Yes, uh, that is actually the same uh, advice I can give you from the industry perspective. On many projects, I've had the teams decide to suddenly write their own ORM abstraction over the database of whatever sort. And the solution is great at first and then horrible later because nobody knows how it works and there's no way to Google it and it's just not good anymore. Yeah. You know, um, l- little funny at first because it doesn't look like SQL at all, but um, SQLize is fantastic. It gets my seal of eh. But now Group Project 2 has finally begun. Um, we have our groups. We had our first day working on what we're going to be bu- building. And we're in little teams of five this time, so a little smaller than last time. And it's not as if you weren't in a team of five initially last time, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, we were in a team of four, then it ended up being seven. And yeah, so it grew because you got merged. Yes, and there were merge conflicts of ideas and everything else, and it wasn't the best. But we made it through it, and I got an A That's out That's good. It, and I was happy Very with my good. Name. Um, so uh, this time you have a five-person team. So do you have overlap from the previous team? Yep, two of them. Uh, I got two new group members and two old group members. And okay, that's not too bad. That's okay. Yeah. Well, well, there's there's 21 of us now. Like the, the class has shrunk. Like it, the likelihood of getting somebody you've already had is getting higher. So 21 out of how many originally? Uh, 35. I don't know. Okay. So yeah, I mean it's it's going down. It's That's what happens. going down. And so before we talk about the idea and the, the plan of this project, how long do you have to complete this project? We have roughly two weeks. Roughly two weeks. So is that is that the same amount of time as last time? Yes. Um, okay. But it's the way the days fall, it feels a little shorter. 
Okay. Um, because we got to start on a Tuesday because when we are Saturdays are our merged class and it's just nothing gets done right on Saturday. It gets loud when we have like both classes in there and we're all trying to talk over each other and stuff. It's not really set up for it's it's a room for one class, not two classes. Right. So do you do you feel about do you feel about two weeks being the right amount of time or would you prefer to be a little longer? Right, right amount of time. I, I would think that um, with how the six month boot camp is paced, if we had any longer, it just it wouldn't flow with the class because we move okay. so fast with all these things. Yep, for sure. Well, cool. So let's uh, let's talk about the idea because it's uh, something that's pretty pretty good for an idea. Yes, um, this is very doable, and that is why I like this one. So one of the group members suggested that we made a D and D creator. Um, it would keep track of all your stats and inventory. So you you generate a character sheet for the fifth edition of D and D, and possibly other editions would come as a stretch goal because each edition is a little finicky. Um, I'm trying to advocate that we don't have any edition and just the user creates the fields that they want. I want to have templates of fifth edition character sheets and that you can modify to make your own, but otherwise it would just be very, very narrow. Like the, uh, we're trying to make this as we're looking for the biggest audience as possible instead of just sure. people looking to play just fifth edition D and D. But you know, uh, if we make it just for him, that's fine, because all we have to do is demonstrate that we can do the things to get our points. And that's the end of the day, that's all the project is. So when you when you think about making some fields like user enterable, like how do you imagine the user interface being for that? And how do you imagine storing that in your database? In little object key pairs. So they would say, like, I want to have this field like so if you want another field in there you'd hit the little plus button and like what do you want to keep track of like do you want to keep track of your alignment like so like pathfinders and stuff that doesn't have the whole i'm lawful good you're chaotic evil stuff and stuff um but it, it still they use the same dexterity const intelligence wisdom and all the other things we're still in the talking phases like nothing's done yet we're still doing that over before tuesday meets i was going to have a few sample ones made for fifth edition and we're going to see how it goes and we kind of said that we were going to make it as simple as possible and then spiral outwards with features and stuff like just yep. get something working. And then, well, now that we have so many, we have five group members and stuff. Uh, they can't wait for one person to get a whole bunch of stuff done and then start adding to it. So if we can just get a bunch of little things going, then we can all start working together on it. That's great. And, and this go around, we're not going to do you're working on the front end, you're going on the back end and stuff. We're all going to mess with each other at all times. We're going to not divvy up the work because we had no idea what the other guy was doing. And when he fell through, it just all was lost. But if we're all messing with each other at all times, then we'll know exactly what needs to get done and what isn't done. And yep. That is a much better pattern yeah. for keeping everybody on the same page. So are you going to have, um, did you make another Slack team thing? Or are you just going to use a, on existing slack existing group slack chat. we just have a group chat and we have uh github projects and we have a little kanban board and we have a bunch of tasks set up and that's how i want to keep them set up but i also know that a couple group members won't use it yeah that that always happens i'm not i'm not a big fan of kanbaning too early uh it it, it i don't know the scope of your project with your team members but I find that if you Kanban too early, it's just too overwhelming and nobody will really care. So when you do it in the industry, is it like just for bug fixes or what do you use it for? So you can you can model it that way. But typically the Kanban is a combination of new features, continued development, uh, tech debt payments, um, and, and of course bug fixes. So, you know, you have your backlog, you have your uh, ready in progress, and then you have done. Uh, you might have other columns for other things, but that's pretty much the core set. And then you just you just go through them. If if somebody is a server side backend developer, they'll do those. But if somebody is a full stack developer, they'll do whatever is next on the top in the priority list. That's cool. And do you actually use it for each project you're on? And that's the thing. So when I'm when I'm working alone, there's no point to having a Kanban board, really, right? Yeah, I, mean, I can imagine like, that. I I know exactly what I'm going to work on next. Also, I'm making the decisions, so. I don't really need to communicate that to anybody. 
On the other hand, if I'm working in a team of five people, like, yeah, I think that's a good time to start a Kanban board. But if I'm the only person putting in cards or tickets or whatever you call them at the time, then there's really no value either there. There have been other projects where we've had a board, and then in the final weeks of the project before a production launch, we really need to be on top of things, and there's a lot of stuff going on. So what we did is we converted all of the remaining two production cards to sticky notes, and we put them on the wall, and we made fake little columns with tape, and we moved them through physically in the office. And there's a uh, really fun sense of progression as the physical things move across the swim lanes well, that's kind of cool it is kind of fun yeah let's talk about the requirements for this particular group project too well last time it was just we had to use firebase we had to make an api call with ajax and then we had to have a css file and a javascript file and our html file like there's literally like five files well oh, there's mm-hmm. a few pages but either way we were we were, we were we were like six pages into this this time we have to make it an actual project that actually looks legitimate. Um, and So there are standards now. There are standards, and that, I feel, is going to help us a lot because not having That's any good. standards last time made a huge headache for us. Okay, so let's, let's talk about some of those standards. So what do you need to have? Well, we need to use SQLize, which forces you to use uh, the model view control folder system. Like you have to have your configurations. You have to have all that. When you run SQLize init and stuff, it creates all that stuff for you. Um, okay. So, um, and we're also going to use handlebars and stuff. And so that has to, you have to have the layouts folder and you have to have everything else set up that way. So just by running those tools and stuff, it's forcing us to actually keep things organized because you you can't. I mean, you have to follow their convention when you use um, handlebars. You you can't deviate too much. And it's going to be a cool little thing. But basically, we have to use everything we've used in class so far. So we're going to be using Node, Express, Handlebars, SQL, and SQLize. Uh, and along with any NPM package we've used along the way. And we have to find some more that weren't something we talked about in class do you have any ideas for what that might be well uh we have to f- i w- we want to find some way to do any kind of authentication and you were suggesting to me earlier um in slack that i use passport js and we also want to have a way to export a character sheet so let's say you have it done so when you play tabletop games a lot of times people actually want to have paper and pen like they want to like they're just using technology to augment their gaming experience because it's hard to keep track of all this and so we want to have a pdf made for them so they can print it off and take it with them to the tabletop meets and it's just a better way to keep track of stuff um but we just wanted an option because some people are just going to be like hey that's what i bought the ipad for no more paper ever right Um, right but uh and then we have to you know make git and post uh routes and that's what we're going to be doing because they're going to be so you would have to go back and manually update like so when you're level two and stuff you'd go back and change stuff update that And then when your character dies, or if you use items, because we're also tracking inventory. So let's say you used your potion to heal yourself. Well, now you have to go delete that um, because it's been used. I really think this is going to be nice because we have a guy that really, really likes to do front end stuff. And he really likes design. And so one of the requirements is to have a big polished UI. And we're going to have to deploy to Heroku when we're done. And it's going to be the further we get in this class the more fun we're having the the cooler the stuff we're making because i could i would never dream of trying to make this when we were doing group project one this was right way way out of my limits yeah but, well and you just didn't have the background knowledge for it at the time i feel like this project's achievable we can do it in the amount of time and we can still learn quite a bit while doing it and the uh the final note that i have here about the project is that there there is a focus on code quality um and you were you you mentioned earlier about uh, using ESLint. Yes, that was actually one of the exercises today because they are going to force it down our throats that we must make it look beautiful. So I've been using Prettier since day one. Um, some of the coworker or some of the co class horts, cohorts, there's a word for them. Uh, classmates uh, haven't been, and then they, their code looks pretty bad. Um, but if it, at the end of the day, if it works, it works. But still everything it's best when everything looks the same um and so we had to use their little es lint rules to format like so 
it would throw an error if somebody used single quotes instead of double quotes, if somebody used too many spaces, if somebody did num underscore one. Well, that's not camel case. There's no underscores in that. They should get rid of that underscore. Um, and it's just you set up the rules and then you everyone follows the rules. Also ran into a thing I've never seen before in my long lines of using commands in the CLI interface and flags. So to run lint in the terminal, so it's npm run lint, which is fine so far, space dash dash, that's, 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 that's common, space dash dash fix. And I have never seen dash dash space dash dash four dashes. It's a lot of dashes yeah, in uh, one command. That, that is a lot of dashes. And that is because NPM is an awful thing and you should not use NPM. Um, so what that means is, and it's just, it's just so, it's just so weird. So the, there's a run command there, as you can obviously see. Yep. And then lint is a sub command that is attached to presumably something in package JSON. Now, if you need to give arguments to run, well, how does it know if it's an argument for run or if it's an argument for the lint command? Well, the dash dash, the first set of dashes, that represents the boundary between arguments for run and the boundary for arguments for lint. Huh. And it's just it's just a mess. Now, alternative package managers, such as Yarn, uh, do not suffer from this issue because they are set up differently and you can just give all of the arguments to whatever commands you're trying to run, and it just works. And do you, you endorse Yarn everywhere? I endorse Yarn everywhere. It is, uh, for me, pretty much always better. After we use ESLint, um, so in our group project one, we had to protect our master branch so nobody could push straight to that. We had to check out a branch, work on it, and then have somebody look over our code to merge it back into master. Now we're using uh, Travis CI to force ESLint to make the code beautiful. Um, and then you can do that. So first, you have to get it to work on your local machine. You have to pass the ESLint rules. Then you connect to GitHub. And GitHub, we have our GitHub set up where uh, Travis CI will always be running on it. And then so it won't let you unless it passes the same rules. Yep. And I think it's going to be a pain because so Josh tried something with an arrow function earlier and it hates arrow functions. It hates arrow functions. Yes, you have to put parentheses around the first part. So Oh. It's just you have to That's okay. it looks funny when you start adding in parentheses. You can you can tell prettier to set that up. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to Well, well he's uh one of the, you'd like him. He's using uh Sublime instead of VS Code for everything. No, I would not like that. That sounds awful. I thought you were a big fan of Sublime. I am a big fan of Sublime as a text editor, but not as a way to code. Ah. Although, it is funny, though, you mentioned that because Sublime's open right now. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> so, uh, you, you're using Travis CI. Are you using it to build anything, or is it just for code quality checks? Right now, it is just for code quality check. Um, and to be honest, I haven't used it yet. Like, um, I haven't pushed anything up. We haven't checked it. I've pulled down because uh, we had a... Well, once we got everything set up, we all pulled down just to make sure we had access to the repo and stuff. Because you don't want to go home when you're all working on a group project to find out you can't actually do anything. But I haven't tried pushing up yet because I haven't had anything to push. You mentioned that you were pushing uh, your code up to GitHub and then using Travis to check it. And eventually you need to deploy to Heroku. Do you think you'll use Travis to deploy to Heroku? Yes, and actually the funny thing is is Heroku is listed as one of the biggest users of Travis CI. They have uh, a list of a few people who use them, and there they are, Heroku. Cool. Yeah, the uh, the learning how to, maybe not even learning all of CICD, which is continuous integration and continuous deployment, even if you can learn pieces of that, that goes a long way because... CICD is something that's so critical to product advancement that it can get easily overlooked, I think, in, in some bootcamp material, but any focus on it is better than none. And so for CICD, the CI, the continuous integration, having your code get checked by something automatically whenever you push it, that is so good. It's so useful. Uh, and then on the other hand, having your code automatically deployed for you when it does pass, that is also so good and so useful 
And that's when it goes up from Travis to Heroku. I don't imagine we deployed a Heroku till we had something working. The best time to deploy to Heroku is when you don't have anything working. So you, you simply construct in your, I don't know, little repo, a super simple hello world kind of thing. And you just have it deploy the first time and you just have it deploy the second time. And so that way, if it ever fails, you'll know that, oh, well, we broke it now. So waiting is probably worse than just getting something to go right now. Well, that would be nice. So we have people working on just the front end and stuff. And so they're not going to have the whole schemas and everything else and not going to be able to test the data and stuff because they're the UI people are going to want to test it to see if it works. And if they don't have the stuff I'm supposed to give them, you know, you bring up a valid point. It's almost like you work in the industry. Could be sometimes, not every day. Another weird thing I found about NPM, so I was using handlebars the other day for something, and I was leaving one of the configurations as default. I found a vulnerability. It was a threat level low, and it wasn't very important, but I'm like, huh, I've never seen this NPM audit fix before, or NPM audit. And so I ran it, and then it gives you this beautiful link to explain what you need to actually do, and it's just, I've never seen that before, and I thought that was a really nice feature of NPM. That is really cool. So the one that you linked here was the insecure default configuration for final handler, I guess. And I love the part about the remediation, like what can you do to fix it? And it says here, no fix is currently available. Consider using an alternative module until a fix is made available. So in other words, it'll never happen. And and this just happened on May 3rd. So yesterday as of recording. Wow, that's that's pretty timely. Yeah, Uh, that is a really cool feature. And I'm really glad that NPM does that. It's a um, it, it it is totally and one hundred percent a valuable thing to have. Where, where I work right now, uh, in our pipeline, we use something called X Ray from JFrog, and X Ray is kind of like npm audit, but for not just npm code, but for pretty much any packaged code. So whether that be Java or uh, .NET C sharp code or even C++ modules, uh, eventually Rust modules from Cargo, um, and of course NPM. Wherever they're from, JFrog uh, X-Ray will scan that and make sure they're safe. In addition to even modules like that, it'll also scan Docker images, which is very important because, as you can imagine, a Docker host uh, needs to be able to be secure, and the images that it is running needs to be at least probably non-malicious yeah so that's a that's a really cool service doing the audit thing every so often is always a good idea well i just ran npm install and then it just it told it's like hey you need to do this now and Mm because you you know every time you do something update something you're always running npm install yep so as you know i've been using firefox pretty much exclusively since i you know put ubuntu back on the laptop and now you also use the laptop exclusively, is that correct? That is correct, and it hasn't burned up. I was kind of worried about um, thermal throttling and thermal dis- nuclear meltdown, uh, because I have melted a laptop before. It's it's possible, because I have, I don't know, I have my laptop kind of set up as a desktop right now. I have my mouse, keyboard, uh, a couple monitors, uh, my, you know, audio interface and stuff. It's it's pretty loaded down, and it has done very well temperature-wise. That's good. And I'm having a lot better time keeping track of everything when I'm not shifting between computers because I could just for sure unplug the all the cables and then just walk away and have all my files. Everything's there and it's just easy. Life's easy. But I take it for granted because life is easy because of all my extensions in Firefox. Uh, my LastPass especially. Uh, when you don't have LastPass and uBlock and everything else, you don't understand how ugly the web is. Like, having to log in, having to manage passwords and stuff by hand. I mean... Having to see ads? Yeah, it's just... I cried when I went to YouTube to watch a video for something, and I'm like, wait, what is... Those are ads on YouTube? That's impossible. Because I have an extension... I have So I have uBlock Origins, and I also have this one just for enhancing YouTube. Because, you know, there's YouTube ads, before, there's preload ads and stuff. Well, there's a way to skip all that with an extension. Um, like... Um, I have I don't really use them yet, but I have them. I have the React Developer Tools. I have all these extensions. There's a little bit of an issue with Firefox, where every single extension on the planet somehow got marked as being unsecure, and it was fixed within 12 hours, but it was still 
a very weird 12 hours because the error, the page it gives you is something from 2017. I'm like, oh, uh uh-oh, I don't have a legacy extension. What's going on? Um, And it was just a pain. And then when I saw a somebody else having this and actually wrote an article about it on TechCrunch, and I'm like, oh, I can rest easy. I'm not the only one. Yeah, you are not the only one. Uh, this morning on Hacker News, uh, it was one of the top articles, top stories, and everybody was going crazy about it. And, you know, Firefox and Mozilla have had a rough few years. They've done some things that have not made the uh, community so happy. And uh, this was uh, an- another thing that did not make everybody so happy. I still love you, Firefox. It's okay. You can you can like Firefox. I also use Firefox for various things. Uh, and it's also just nice to have a browser that's not logged into everything so they can't track me. So, uh, let's see here. So we've got Group Project 2 going, and you're working on that. Uh, what does the next week look like for you? Well, the next two weeks, we uh, homeworks are optional, and all we have to do is work on this group project. And so we hopefully will have something spectacular and beautiful. Great. Uh, I guess I'll be checking in with you next weekend for the next episode of In Boot Camp, where we will talk all about your group project and its progress. And I'm Hopefully this goes really well because right now we just have everything set up, but I don't know. I'm not anticipating any failures. It should be spectacular and radiant. I I can only hope so. I mean, uh, the 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 polished look and feel is a big deal because last time the end result was not so uh, clean. Yeah, uh, for all the listeners that never did see the project one, um, we never changed font families. It was whatever. And an H1 tag was whatever your browser defined an H1 tag as. And yeah, the guy who was supposed to do it decided he didn't want to do it. Now, we ha- the way we have handlebars set up is once we have like a, a main layout and stuff, our header is made once and then is rendered on all pages on demand. On, no, on request, the page is generated with the header for all the pages. Yeah, I know you said it was kind of out of style, but I think handlebars are kind of cool. It's very cool uh, to begin with. I see what you did there. Where can I find you on the internet? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at RyanMar and, of course, on my website, RyanRapperset.com, where I promote LastPass, even though it costs a lot. Yes, it costs $40 a year, which is going to be the... This is the last year I'm going to be paying for LastPass Premium. I've already paid for the coming up year, so... uh, I'm totally going to remember March of next year to stop. I, I doubt that, but that's okay. But I'll remember, and so I will suggest switching to Bitwarden before then. You have a referral link for them? Uh, no, it's free and open source and self-hostable, so no. I see. Mm-hmm. Where can we find you on the internet? You can find me at the nexus.tv slash the people's page, and you can also find me at matthewpetrol.com. Excellent. And of course, you can leave comments for us and interact with the group here at the reddit.com slash r slash the nexus TV. And of course, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Have a good one. Have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the Technological, technological Convergence. Convergence.